Thank you so much, Colin. Uh, really interesting and critical uh, take on Garvey. I think it's actually great that you haven't uh, valorized him and instead of taking a historical critical approach or lens to his life. And I personally find that really helpful actually. So now is a part of the event that I get to do the grilling uh, and just spend about 15 to 20 minutes or so just dissecting and expanding on some of the points that you've made in your presentation, as well as some of the themes that came out in the book. I know that everyone will have plenty of questions, but may I ask that you write them down and just hold on to them for a few moments more until we open up to you and your thoughts. So my first question to you, Colin, is just regarding um, Garvey's appeal. So why do you think it was that Garvey appealed to so many and and so many still have him placed as a hero in the realm of Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism. What was it that resonated and still resonates with people so much? I think it was because he was an undiluted Black man and he was earnest, he was sincere, and he had this great vision. Um, my mother would often tell me when I was growing up and the rest of my siblings, without a vision, the Bible says you perish. So he recognized that and he had a vision and was able to transmit that vision. And as I said earlier, it was because he was this silver tongued orator. And there's nothing that black people like, in my opinion, than someone who can speak eloquently um, and hold their own to the white man at a time when, as I said, they were at the footstool of society. But also I think they appreciated his fierceness and he was not timid in any shape or form. And also I recognize, I think they recognize that uh, all of the great forces were up against him. I don't know how Garvey got out of bed in the morning. There were so many people out there to do him harm and so many enemies, even in his own camp, who were there to trip him up. And I think people who appreciated Garvey realized that. And even it meant that the uh, projects that he started would fail at least they would try. Um, we all got very excited in, in 2008 when we had our first black American president. But Garvey was saying, yes, you can, you know, almost a century before. And I think people appreciated that, that, uh, that there was this great feeling of sucker and comfort and sense of belonging that Garvey embodied. And he not only felt that he transmitted that. Um, and I think that these, these are kind of long lasting eternal thoughts that go down from generation to generation. People talk about genes being passed down, but sometimes memes are passed down as well. And the meme of Marcus Garvey, I think will be with us for a long time, primarily because he was so ambitious, he was so sincere and so determined to do good. Okay, so then do you think that that perhaps unapologeticness and that strength as a black man that people appreciated, has that allowed him a certain grace when it comes to say projects that didn't go to plan or things that were more questionable? So one being, for example, his statement about the UNIA uh, wanting to civilize the, the backwards tribes of Africa. And it's quite a problematic mission to have, but is he kind of given a certain Grace, do you think, because of how much he is revered? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a damning statement, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, a statement that would damn him. And um, I'm sure he wouldn't have um, projected and proselytized and promoted that statement at a time when he was negotiating with the Liberian authorities to buy land in Africa. It's not a good starting point, is it? So mm -hmm. I don't think he pushed that particular line, but I think you also have to explain and contextualize where he came from. And as I was uh, intuiting, he was a man brought up in the British Empire, uh, brought up to understand that Africa was a despicable place, a despised place, a place that had produced nothing without the European input. And um, in a sense, it's difficult to resist that. Um, mm -hmm. But also he had a kind of arrogance and he had the kind of titanic certainty that comes with genius, I think. Um, and he failed fundamentally because he stopped listening, I think. He, uh, he had this arrogance that he could be proclaimed the provisional president of Africa because he had all these cronies around him saying, yes, you can. Um, the people who's, who, 
who doubted him, even in his camp, who, who criticized him, he expelled them. Um, he was like um, a Roman general. I liken him to a Roman general who has been successful in the height of the Roman Empire, uh, putting the Gauls to the sword, renewing the Roman Empire. He's going to be allowed a victory parade through Rome, but he has to leave his troops on the other side of the, the River Tiber. Uh, he gets into a chariot. He's allowed a slave in the chariot to drive him. And as that chariot is driving through Rome and people are showering him with libations and flowers and the applause is cresting, it's the job of the enslaved person to whisper to the general, remember you are only human. And unfortunately, the higher Garvey rose, the fewer people he had telling him that. He was this great orator who had a great ability to talk to people, but ultimately had a, he had a tin ear. And that tin ear also extended towards uh, Africa because I think he had a very naive and romantic idea of Africa and thought he could just walk in there and they would <laughs> welcome him with open arms. And um, that he had no sense of the kind of the, the politics of the place that he was trying to, to secure land from. And so there was a rather arrogant West Indian or Afro-Caribbean perception that they were first and foremost the top guns when it came to black people on the planet. And that's, that's unfortunately the case. Even though he, he led the Universal Negro Improvement Association, he had a, a great sense that the, the real generals would be coming from um, Africa, America, or from the Caribbean. But I think he made a big mistake because um, he didn't understand that people in America, which is, had, which is where he had his great opportunity because they were there in great numbers and they had a certain amount of power and wealth and properties, um, but they had a certain sense that they belonged in America now. And unless Garvey and his lieutenants could replicate Harlem in Monrovia, there was never gonna be a great traffic of African-Americans from Harlem to, to um, Liberia, never. Okay. I mean, you, you mentioned there yourself, this uh, self-proclaimed title of president of Africa, very audacious uh, move for him to have made. Um, what do you think the impact of that was? So him, him giving himself that title, what impact do you think that had in terms of how people viewed him or, or the movement as a whole? Well, his followers, and he had thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of followers um, adored him. As I said at the beginning, there was God and there was Garvey. And this was the manifestation of their God writ large on earth. And so they applauded him. I think they reveled in the fact that one of them, do you remember, I mean, you're too young to remember, but there was a time uh, in Britain in the 60s and 70s uh, where there's no black people on television. And whenever there was any black person, you'd be on the phone to your friends, quick, quick, black person on the team. Just that great sense of belonging and that great sense of hope that you invested that person with, Garvey had that hundreds, thousands, millions of times because people recognized there was nothing else out there. And the big story was this great street orator, Garvey, or you can have the fair-skinned, snobbish, tertiary-educated Du Bois. No competition. Okay. I mean, I was going to ask you about Du Bois, to be honest. Um, this dislike or, or rivalry or the, these issues that you seem to have with Garvey, would you say it was more down to elitism or was it perhaps just a difference when it came to to method or something else entirely? Yeah, well, you can never uh, underestimate the titanic certainty of people who consider themselves to be geniuses. And I think Garvey thought he was a genius, so did Du Bois. And I think they had this great arrogance and sense of their own importance. And they were like two bulls in a paddock um, fighting it out. Um, and for many, many years in the uh, late 1919s and early 20s, 1920s, 21, 22, Garvey was the man. And I think Du Bois was jealous of him. Um, he couldn't understand how this usurper, this Johnny-come-lately from the Caribbean could leapfrog over him 
and command such attention. This man who wasn't even educated, gone to no university, there's no university in the Caribbean. And here he was, he'd been schooled all his life, Du Bois, to think of himself as a top guy, le the leader of uh, African Americans. And suddenly this um, uncouth, garish, uh, overly dressed, flamboyant buffoon takes his place. Um, so there was that animosity. I think also he um, doubted, and he maybe was quite right to doubt, that there would be any opportunity in a meaningful way for African Americans to leave America and go to Africa. He thought it was a mistake. And the idea that you should up sticks and leave was anathema to Du Bois because African Americans had been in America since the foundation. The foundation story is said to be uh, uh, Plymouth, the Plymouth Rock, you know, the, the, the pioneers arriving in 1620. Um, but Angolans, enslaved Angolans arrived the year before. So Africans had been in America from the start. They were the real foundation story. The story wasn't the Mayflower, it was the, it was the ships that brought the enslaved people before. And so after three, 400 years, you're not going to say, okay, we made a bit of a mistake. We'll, uh, we'll cut our losses and we'll go back to Africa, which we have no real connection with anymore because it's over there. We're gonna make our, our lives here. And God was saying, uh, no, no, let's give America to the white man and we'll ship out and, and start our own empire and not be governed by anybody else. So there was this great fundamental philosophical difference between the two as well. Okay. It's interesting. I've, I've always personally put it down to some type of classism, elitism, but the, the idea of him being jealous of him, I find really, um, really interesting. Yeah. So when it comes to um, education, so we know that, as you've mentioned before, you know, you have, um, no formal education. Do you know much about his, his views on the importance of education, especially again, being that education level is another one of the main differences between the NAACP and, and the UNIA? Do you know how he viewed education as a, as a tool, for instance? Absolutely, yeah. He was fundamentally uh, uh, given to this idea that you could not achieve anything without education. And he understood that people were held back through a lack of education. And he was lucky enough to go to England in 1912, spent two years there, visited the British Library every day, and educated himself. It was there that he read uh, Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. It was there that he, he read uh, Blyden, Wilmot Blyden, Edward Wilmot Blyden. Um, and he recognized that actually a lack of education kept people down. So. Uh, his newspaper, The Negro World, was a great tool towards education. Um, the, the books and the pamphlets that he put together, um, his philosophy and opinions were devoured by people. Um, there was, as you are doing, he was given to schools. He was given to forging relationships with teachers and having Saturday schools, having their own um, African history lessons taught to young African-Americans uh, young people in the West Indies. Um, all through his life, he recognized the, the great importance of education because he'd been denied it and had to find it himself. When he was a young boy, it was often said that he'd pick up three or four words and new words in the day, and he'd wander around St. Anne's Bay in Jamaica, practicing them, those words, he'd, you know, working them into conversations with his mates. He was like a walking philosopher from the age of 10. And uh, he had his own little group of followers, even at that age, and recognized that they weren't following him because he was pretty or, or because he was tall. He wasn't tall, he was you know, a small guy. They were following him because of his knowledge, because of his words, because of his wisdom gleaned from education. Yes, yeah, so education was, was fundamental to his understanding of how you could transcend the plight that people found themselves in at that time. Okay, thank you. So another thing that you highlighted uh, in your chapter was the way in which the Garveyites had a tendency to perhaps romanticize Africa. Yeah. Um, would you say that that's something that's still quite prevalent today? Um, and if so, could that have any negative 
consequences in terms of people roman overly romanticizing Africa now. Yes, I think that there's still a tendency to overly romanticize Africa, but it's also coupled by this sense of poor Africa, pity Africa. Um, but I think when Garvey was around, there was a great store to be held by associating yourself with Africa, with Africans. Um, hence the, the, the adoration of, of Selassie. You know, so, I mean, Garvey in a way, he was playing um, John the Baptist to Harvey Selassie's um, Jesus Christ. And again and again, uh, he would direct people to Psalm 68, I think it is. My sister will tell me whether I got that right or not. Sonia, you could shout out if I got this wrong. Uh, Ethiopia, so stretch out her hands onto God. And princes shall come out of Egypt. It's the other way around. It's princes come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall stretch out her hands onto God. So this is a great sense that there's the possibility of being saved through Africa. Africa is the, is the savior. Um, and there were many charlatans who um, benefited from that. There are lots of prince, so-called princes from Africa who came over and um, inveigled themselves into Garvey's camp and um, you know, fleeced him. Um, but equally, I think that's the same is true today. Is there's this sense that there's a kind of purity of Africa. Um, even when you think about um, the, the notion that there's this possibility for forgiveness, that Africans can have the, the most terrible things happen to them, but they have this sort of seat in their heart to enable them to forgive. I mean, that's what was said about Mandela, that the, the Africans have this great capacity to forgive. And that's a romantic idea. And obviously there's terrible things going on as well, but the sense that there's a kind of, the, the real true black man or black woman or black person is an African. I mean, Peter Toss said it straight, didn't he? So long as you're a black man, you're an African. You know, that's the test. Do you align yourself with Africa or not? And, and that notion has been there right from the beginning of Agave's movement for sure. And it's still, as you, as you know, present in, in many parts of the world today. Yeah, true. Um, so a big part of his Back to Africa movement was the, uh, the Black Star Line, yeah. uh, which on paper is a very kind of bold step within that movement. So um, as opposed to just talking about things, actually trying to make things happen. So would you say that that project was simply too ambitious? Or were there perhaps key mistakes that were made that led to its eventual failure? Um, so there are some nations, there are some people who have not been the beneficiaries of modernity. Mm -hmm. um, you go to some, when I would go to um, Ghana 20 years ago, there would be some places that there was no great infrastructure for electricity, say. And so instead of having a, a landline, they skip, they jump straight to the mobile phone because the infrastructure is not there. Mm -hmm. And the same is true as what Garvey was doing because there's no sense of anybody in the African diaspora having a great vision about industries that could be built. They might have a, a restaurant or a laundrette and Garvey started small with restaurants and laundrettes, but then he skipped very quickly to a shipping line. Whoa, you might want to give yourself a bit more time to understand the lay of the land and understand about commerce and trade and particular naval business um, insurance. Um, so he was acting ignorantly because he was trying to make up very quickly for what had been lost, but also recognize that there was a symbol that if you, could, if you could show, if you could visualize your vision, you were halfway there to taking people with you. And so the ships, when they were bought, they became symbols. I mean, the, the enemies and the detractors would say that they're propaganda tools, but they were symbols of what was possible. And, and I said in the presentation, the problem was that at the time, there are very few black people in America that had licenses to be captains of ships. 
there were only about a couple. And one of them was this guy, Coburn. And he was a crook. I'm sorry if there's any relation of Coburn out there. <laughs> In my mind, the guy's a crook. Um, but Garvey didn't recognize it until it's too late. So it was a great idea. It was a great ambitious idea. But equally, um, Garvey, for being this great showman, this great organizer, was not a great business person. And he famously said uh, when the shipping line failed and when he was arrested for so-called mail fraud, which is a trumped up charge anyway, but he said he gave everyone a chance with any circle when it came to building and benefiting from the Black Star Line and every single person fleeced him. That's what he says. It wasn't entirely true, but a lot of people were lying in their own pockets rather than supporting him in his great idea that was going to be of benefit to everyone. So he was naive in essence, because I think also he was one of those naive people who believes if he's sincere and opens the door, like-minded people walk through the door and join him in his great project. They did walk through, but they weren't always sincere. Also, he got rid of um, his wife. I mean, that was a mistake. If, <laughs> if Amy Ash would have been on board, she would have chipped him in the, in the ribs a few times and to turn to stop being a fool and to, to see that the FBI might have planted an informant mm. in, in the very heart of your organization. I mean, there are informants that were, they became his right-hand men. That's how, that's how wise he was. I mean, he was, he was fooled by sycophancy, unfortunately. And he was fooled to cut off the tops of the heads of the people who were going to, not physically, but you know, cut them out of the organization. Um, and so he, um, he failed, but I think that the, the notion of the shipping line didn't fail because any time that ship pulled into port, whether it be in Costa Rica or Cuba, uh, the harbor would be lined with tens of thousands of people. Yeah. And they saw this as their moment. This was the moment. This is the moment that things are really going to change. And so sincere, I think, was Garvey that when he was eventually arrested and falsely charged with mail fraud and, and sent to the Atlanta penitentiary for two years, uh, the president of America at the time received tens, if not hundreds of thousands of letters from Garvey supporters, from the very people that he'd sold the shares to telling the president, uh-uh, you've got the wrong man. Garvey is innocent. Mm -hmm. So even though they'd lost out financially by buying shares that were worthless, they still celebrated and believed in his sincerity and then the value of trying to build the shipping line in the first place. Okay.